In 1970, the National Park Service created the Volunteers in Parks Program, or VIP, that allows individuals to play an active role in helping protect and share our national treasures. Since then, volunteers of every age, background, and ability log millions of hours annually in this program. A few months ago, we approached Dave Cooper, our Park Service liaison, along with Susan Mackworth and Jeanette Hoopman, volunteer coordinators, past and present, to assist us in reaching out to VIPs and see what interest there might be in sharing our, their experiences. And I cannot go on without turning the page here. Today, we are delighted to have five Lightkeeper volunteers giving three presentations as they share their stories of working on four different islands and includes Devils, Sand, Raspberry, and Michigan Light Stations. We'll have Washburn's own Marty Cole, who is here to tell us her story of working on Raspberry Island for two separate seasons, summer and fall, in two separate years. Welcome, Marty. Where are you? I hope she didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> then later in the program, we have Mike and Kathy Storms from Cornucopia. As Lightkeeper volunteers on Michigan Island, they will share their history, which might include both fun and sobering realities that come with the job. But first up, we have John and Karna Campion, who get the Furthest Distance Award, having driven all the way from Wisconsin Dells to talk about the process of becoming a VIP and their experiences on both Devils and Sand Island Light Stations. Thank you, speakers, for coming from all distances in the dead of winter. And thanks to everyone here today. You're in for a real treat, believe me. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm winter welcome to John and Carla Campion. Well, thank you. And thank you for coming out on a, a cool day. Okay, cool. That's who we are. Um, yeah, thank you for coming out and uh, to listen to our stories about volunteering in your national park. We appreciate it. And we first heard about volunteering in the Apostles back in 1985 when we were scuba diving the Great Lakes and moving the Apostle Islands. And uh, we kind of a lot of times visited different shipwrecks and uh, very much enjoyed it. And one year when we were up, uh, one of the people diving with us said, oh, I volunteer out on Michigan, which we'll be hearing about in a little bit here. And um, my wife, Carla, really enjoys lighthouses and said, you know, that's got to be on my bucket list <laughs> to do lighthouse volunteering. So, I could. So, in uh, 2016, uh, we found at volunteer.gov a uh, application for volunteering as a lighthouse keeper uh, in the Apostles. And uh, we filled that out. And um, uh, a little bit later in the season, in January and February, we uh, were contacted that we were uh, in the process to become a volunteer. So we had our phone interview. Um, and then, uh, of course, they did our reference check. You have to have that now. And uh, this is Jeanette Hoopman that in early March offered us a stand, a stand um, on sand for three weeks and uh, really thought that was pretty amazing because we weren't quite sure that um, that we would be chosen um, and, but figured when we did our first uh, return on the application process I do farming a little bit down by Wisconsin Dells and figured okay the crops are in yeah I could go to an island for three weeks and Carla was working at the antique mall and the Dells and they always said, well, you can have as much time off as you want. 
So uh, we were happy to be chosen. So along with the um, offer and the acceptance, we did get some position information, and that helped a lot to know what are we going to do for three weeks out on an island. And uh, duty station that we did, going to be greeting visitors. Oh, yes, you have to raise, raise the flag every day and do a daily weather, maintain the grounds and the trails. I enjoy doing the trails because you get out and make a nice trail to walk on. is very nice. Um, we got some uh, job hazardous analysis forms. Yep, it's a government job, so they have everything analyzed of all the hazards of mowing a lawn and you know cleaning an outhouse and such. So uh, radio etiquette. We use radios for communications because cell phones don't work and the internet's not out there yet. Um, I don't. I hope it never is because it's kind of nice to be away from that and. The fun part is learning about the island, and um, there was many different uh, documents on the history of Sand Island that we could then incorporate into conveying information to visitors on the island. The um, missed this one. I'd like to play special tribute to previous VIPs from 2013 to 16 in that they wrote the unofficial guide to volunteering at Sand Island. And it uh, expounded more about kind of some prep things, which is, uh, you know, uh, hard to think about when you're going to be going out on an island for two or three weeks. Um, prior to our actual stay out on the island, we came up for official summer um, training uh, Monday, Tuesday was for all staff talking about what is new this year in the park, what projects are we hoping to get done. And I also liked the new volunteer uh, breakout session where we could ask volunteers that have done it before, what's it like, you know, what do you need? Um, Wednesday, Thursday, Karen and I participated in operational leadership um, to become an effective leader. and. Um, we also thought this being our first experience in 2017 of volunteering for the national parks, that that might be a good thing to take. And on Friday, we have CPR and first aid training. Um, when you're out on an island, 911 does not respond within five minutes. <laughs> so um, it might be next morning or sometime the next day. So then we had our prep to go. Um, you know, clothing. What are you going to wear? Because you never know what weather is going to do. And um, for bedding, we just decided to use sleeping bags on our uh, on the beds that are provided. So there are beds out there. We didn't have to camp, like most visitors to the islands. Um, food was an interesting one because we never really knew if the solar system was going to be working well enough for the refrigerator to work when you're out there. Okay, so now what am I going to eat for three weeks? Um, but we discovered that, you know, with the cooler, you can keep food for a while, fresh at the beginning and towards the end. You then um, are looking at dry foods and canned foods to go through. So, um, lack of communication I already mentioned. And, oh, food is there again. That's good. Very important. I am on a seafood diet. I see food and eat it. So, <laughs> um, and luckily, though, we didn't have to fish for our own food. Uh, we were able to bring it. But without having a general store out there, you did have to bring it and hopefully have enough in, in case uh, and have some. We also package things in uh, waterproof containers so that because you're traveling on a boat out there, you never know if you're going to get splashed by a wave, and there goes your spaghetti. <laughs> so then July 11th, we headed out. <laughs> Luckily, we didn't have to row out, and we were using the Park Service boats, uh, which are very uh, nice, and you can be enclosed, or you can be out and be splashed by waves. Um, we left from. Uh, let me try this technology. It works. Little Sand Bay, 
And the day that we went out with Jeanette Hoopman, um, we ran out to Devil's Island to exchange a volunteer out there, and then uh, came to Sand Island. And it was kind of interesting. They were saying that some weather was coming in, and okay, weather's coming in. And we kind of get back to Sand, and they run the bags up to the um, to the cabin that we're on at East Bay, and um, then signed some papers, and Jeanette and the boat driver took off. I are, are looking at each other. Well, oh, that was interesting. And the reason was they said there was weather coming in. And I'm sure you all have heard this one. The lake is the boss. Yep, we had a three-day blow. It was great for us because we didn't have any visitors, so we had time to read the materials that was there at the cabin and uh, look around the island and orientate ourselves better to what... Uh, what we were caretakers of for the next three weeks. Um, so in 2018, we did come back, so we did enjoy our time out there. In fact, we, uh, we were offered an option of, you know, do you want to go to Devils for three weeks or Sand for three weeks? And we kind of said, can we do both? Because we've not been on Devils. And um, Jeanette said, sure. Go, go two, three weeks in, so we're able to do that. So, thank you. Um, okay, now. Did you want me to is, advance is this, your slides? Is this advanced? Yeah. Okay, good. Got it. All right. So now, let me tell you my version of actually what happened. <laughs> now, okay. This is a little different. Okay? Boats. I am scared to death of boats. Believe it or not, I scuba dive, but I get seasick so easy. I don't like riding in boats. Okay? So, before we get up for orientation, I know I have to take a boat, okay? But I had looked at the map, Sand Island is such a short distance, not a big deal. I will survive a boat ride, sure I will. Uh -huh. Okay, we get up to Sand Island's orientation. It's wonderful, we're being oriented, we're finding out what other people are saying, and like, oh my god, there's bears on Sand Island, okay? <laughs> Most people say, not a big deal. I say, oh crap. You know what? <laughs> I am scared to death of bears. Way back when I was in college, I spent four summers working in Glacier National Park. Okay, wonderful, except two of my friends were killed by bears. Oh. At that point, I went, nah, -uh. I am not camping in bear country. I am not hiking in bear country. I've done a lot of hiking and stuff but not in bear country. <laughs> now, guess what? I'm going to an island, so I've got to take a boat, and I have got to get past a bear. Yay! Okay, I got it. They say there's bears on the island you've never seen, right? First night we're there, I look out the dining room window, voila, there is a bear. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. And I had told John, I would be the one walking the two miles to the lighthouse myself, and he could man the dock the first couple of days to see, because he's better with boats and people coming out there. I'm like, oh crap, I'm going to do this, right? <laughs> yep. All right. I decided halfway through the night, because I wasn't getting any sleep, if my destiny was to be eaten by a bear, so be it. I was going to get the lighthouse, okay, because I really wanted to see the lighthouse. Okay, head out, not a problem. There were so many bear noises in the woods on that two-mile hike. You would not believe how the bears were in the trees, okay? But I got to the other end, and oh my god, there was the lighthouse. It was so beautiful, and it was so serene, and it was so safe. I was so happy to be there. I had made it. You know? All right. Now, if you get back to where visitors are coming out today, you have no idea who's going to show up on the island. All right, you have people that come out in power boats, they come out in kayaks, canoes, the tour boats. You stand up in the tower and you wave at them, or you stand on the beach and you wave to them, and they wave back, or they honk their horns, or you know, they wave, and it's just really kind of fun, okay? Now, in the past, these are the people that were on the island, okay? You have the West Bay Club, you had the farmers, you had Camp Stella, you know, which that's out there. You had fishermen. Those were the people that used to come to the island. They, they were much more local, they had a better idea of what they were getting into when they got to the island than the people that come out there today. Okay? 1921, automation arrived. Believe it or not, 1921, on Sand Island, they automated the lighthouse. It was the first lighthouse in the area to be automated, which, of course, 
meant the lighthouse keeper was now obsolete. We went from having the beautiful Fresnel lenses in the lighthouses to what they have today, which is just the little solar powered one outside. Okay, it still flashes at the same rate. It's still the same color as it used to be, but it is solar powered and the Coast Guard takes care of all of them. We as caretakers don't even take care of the lights. We are lighthouse keepers, but we don't take care of the lights, okay? <laughs> all right, now you get the first caretaker on sand was Gertrude Wellish. She was there for many years. She had a lot of ties to the island, we all know. Um, and after she left, there were a couple of other caretakers. Um, we do basically the same thing she did. We wash the windows, we take care of the place. Um, the Coast Guard does still man, like I said, the lighthouses, and they were the caretakers of the lighthouse and the grounds on Devil's Island until the park service took it over. So, <laughs> Our quarters for living are a little different than they used to be. Um, when you're on sand, you are staying at the ranger station at the south end of the island or the east end, whichever direction you want to call it, um, so that there's somebody at the, at the boat dock which allows them to show up at two with their boats and stuff. Um, and the tower, of course, is in the lighthouse, but that's a two-mile hike up. When you get out on Devil's Island, you stay in the lead keeper's house, which is the big house here. There is also an assistant keeper's house, and there was a second assistant keeper too, but that building is no longer there. Okay, and there, the tower is not attached, of course, so you, you know, have a very short walk over to the tower compared to the one on sand if you're going to the lighthouse. Okay? All right, now, giving tours is really the best part of being a volunteer, I think. Okay? Like I said, you have no idea who's coming, but you get to give them the information they're looking for, okay? Some of the people, all they want to do is they get to the island, they're getting to the top, they're getting down, they're getting on, they've succeeded. That was their goal, okay? There are people like that. There are people, all they want to hear is about the history of everything on the island in the 20 minutes they're there, okay? That gets kind of interesting too, okay? Um, some people just want to know how you got that job, how you got to be a lighthouse keeper out there. And you say, well, you apply. Well, do they give special preference to veterans? I never did get that question answered. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember seeing it on my application, but it might have been there. Okay. Um, and some people, it's their first time out there. Some people have been there 20 times and know it all. And as soon as you open your mouth, they say, but I thought. <laughs> and you say, okay. There's a lot of different things that people say about this island. Okay. All right. Now. If you get there and people go up the tower, they're always amazed, okay? Um, they want to see different things from the tower, though. Some of them just want to watch the boats down there. And they're amazed that you can still see the big lakers and stuff go by, as you did way back when. A lot of them want to know what that land is over there. Is that Canada? No, it's the North Shore. Oh, well, is that Silver Bay? No, that's two harbors. Okay. Then you go on, and there's some people that just want to watch the boats. They want to see the sailboats. They love the sailboats going by. And then there's those that just want to see where their boat is parked out there, if their boat is parked out there, where their friends are out there. And you've got to figure out what they really want, which in you know two seconds of meeting them makes it really fun. Because sometimes you're way off, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, I had one particular tour this summer. There were five different people. You know, it was a couple of, I think it was three gals and two guys. Okay. They get there. We're outside on the house of sand. Yeah. And they start asking questions. The one individual, he just kept asking questions. What is this arrow on the ground? Why aren't the stairs here? Why, you know, just how, when was this put up? How long did it take? So you get inside and he starts asking about all the questions about the maps on the walls. And you're like, okay, you answer all these. Okay. And of course, you have to remember, they get there at 3.55. Normally, we're supposed to be done about 4. So we knew, I just knew this was going to be a long tour. <laughs> okay. We get started. We finally made it up to the tower. And this individual runs around to the other side with the other guy that's with. He comes back, stands by one of the girls there, drops down on her knee, on his knee, and asks her to marry him. <laughs> okay, this is going to take even longer. <laughs> I did see them in the evening when I 
I was back at the other end of the island to find a house, and they were still engaged. They were still planning a wedding, so I don't think she really meant it when she said yes. Okay? Sorry, I just got to say, I worked for the outfitter that took them out. I broke oh. them back. Did you? Oh, yes, yeah, so they told me they just got married or got engaged. Oh, good. They were still good. That's good. I'm hoping it works, you know? Because he was really nervous and he really needed to know everything because he was putting it off. He just couldn't. <laughs> and there are always questions about the weather on the island and why people are, you know, why? Okay. Why haven't the steps been fixed? All right. If you notice, 2017, the steps were out. See, they are broken. Fine. All right. And you tell them. Okay, I'm sorry when you were here last year, the steps were up. Yes. Well, why haven't they fixed them by now? Well, then you show them the steps that are there this year. Okay, 2018, these are great steps. They are broken. The steps actually were in for about six weeks before they got taken out by the lake again. Okay, <laughs> people don't quite get the connection with the weather up there. Um, as you can see, the boathouse of devils was there in 2017, that's what it looks like in 2018. It was there for almost 100 years, but it is no longer, okay? And the dock and stuff has gone out there. Hence, we didn't have any campers on Devils this summer, where normally they do have campsites there. Um, and if you notice over on this one, you can see there's a big rock here. And I mean, this is a big rock, people. And there's a rock here. There is nothing over here. If you look up on the other picture, there's a huge rock that has come up on the shore. And this rock is there, that one is not. So the lake does do its own thing. And people, I think, when they come out in their boats and they see lake, they're going out on the lake, they picture the little lake in the middle of the state. They don't picture an ocean, which is what this really is. Makes it interesting, though, when you try and explain that to them, and they look and they go, oh, huh. And then they move on. <laughs> you know? That's it. Okay. You also get to explain other things that are going on on the islands, you know. Um, please don't touch the Cornell lens. You know, Devils is the only one that has a good lens in it yet. And sometimes people don't quite get that you can't get this glass anymore and how fragile that really is. So you do have to remind them of that. You gently remind them that if everybody picks all the flowers, there will be none left. Okay? Um, you have to talk about the graffiti on the islands because people always come out and write on the rocks. And you have to explain there's a difference in historical graffiti and just graffiti, okay? Um, you tell them about the cliffs. They don't pop in the way. That's the way it is, you know? Um, there's things besides that type of stuff to see on the island, you know? I mean, if you look, and I really encouraged people to look, and when the kids were there, we were always looking for this type of stuff. You know, the birds, the... Kids love to chase the snowshoe here. They can't catch it. But they love it. You know, uh, we found a snake skeleton this year, which is different. Most people have seen snake skins, but we found a snake skeleton. That was kind of fun. All right. Now, on Devils, which is what most of this is, you can see there is a lot of historical stuff that goes on out there that is historical graffiti versus people writing their names today. Okay? Um, I, this doesn't come out very well, but there is etched in the rock a picture of a devil. Supposedly, way back when, it was probably done by some of the members of the Coast Guard. This one here was the, um, the, part, or the uh, lighthouse service, 1933, is what that one was. Um, the one over here is that incredible bulldozer you just stumble upon on Devil's Island if you're walking around. Okay, that bulldozer has been there for many years. It came from Greenland, believe it or not, because they were going to be doing a rope project, which you can hardly tell it's there now, but anyway. Um, and the sedge that is up in the top happens to be a plant that you find only in Greenland or on Devil's Island. Uh -huh. It was an invasive species that's managed to get transported here. Now, you know, everybody talks about invasive species. I mean, you know, in the lakes, you've got all the lampreys and things that are killing the lakes. On land, you've got purple root stripe, all that stuff. This happened a long time ago, but it happened. So you really do have to be careful when you're transporting things. And people just look at the bulldozer and go, hey, that's cool, and it came from Greenland, but the sedge came also. All right, now if you look, really look at the buildings and stuff, 
There is so much just great detail out there on what you see and what is there, you know, um, that you don't see in buildings today when you look at a rambler. Okay. Um, the the where the, the steps are put together is incredible. I'm not sure if that cleat is still there. That was out in front of Sand Island a couple of years ago. It may have take, gotten taken back by the lake. Um, I had never seen a glass insulator on a lightning rod set up before, and that is you know like at this height on Sand Island. Okay. Um, the the wonderful lightning rod in the middle there. That is so cool to look at because if you see it when you're up top, there are holes all the way around the inside. That is actually there because it was venting for the tower to keep it cooler. Um, you know, and the work that they did, you know, put, I mean, they, the house on Devil's Island is an incredible house to look at. If, if you're into architecture, which I am a little bit, um, you may have noticed, um, you know, they didn't just put a window in. Look at the window they put in. Much different. Than what you're doing today okay this is also the kind of stuff that you can find on the island okay you can find you know the tadpoles and the little frogs if you look the snakes you know unfortunately there are probably bears there <laughs> yeah. let's just skip those though you know um and you know of course when you go out to devils you're looking at the cliffs you know and if you're kayaking or, or snorkeling like we were doing when we were out there you know it's Fun to go through. They are just beautiful, you know. Or you can see, you know, the different streams that come out, the pebbles that come out with it, and you know, the sandstone, the different types of sandstones that are around here. Or the geology and stuff is just really interesting. Um, and if anybody has an idea what that is on the lower right there, my right to your left, um, it it's just kind of sticking out of sand there on Sand Island, and I don't know what it is. It looks like it's from a cistern. That you crank it and it pulls water up. Top of that the could cups. be. You know, it, its cups are just little. So, yeah, and there's a lot of them on the chain, but I, you know, I just thought it was kind of cool. I don't know. <laughs> and as you can see, I take flower pictures. Horticulture is my background, actually. So I spend a lot of time taking pictures of flowers when I've got downtime. And when I was on Devils for 21 days this summer, I found 18 different flowers that were blooming on different days which was just neat to take pictures of. All right. Now, because I kind of into lighthouses, see, um, we did happen to notice that there are many places in the country that you can stay at lighthouses or volunteer at lighthouses. And as you can see, the Apostle Islands is on there with their lighthouses. And I have to tell you that because I, I've done the Lighthouses here now, you know, I was on sand for one summer, for two summers now, and I've been on devils. It gave me the courage, we'll say, to volunteer somewhere else for the National Park Service. So I spent November and December this year down in New Mexico volunteering at El Moro National Monument. Okay? It was great. And then in December, of course, they shut the government down, so I came home. And I don't know if here the government. Right. Okay. So, and we wish to thank the you and the Park Service for allowing us to do this, and we will be back on Sand Island this summer again, if all goes as planned. So, that, I think, is all John and I have for our part of the presentation. So, Marty, are you up? I think I am. All right. <laughs> I dreamed about 
keeping off my house on an island. It would be a solitary time, reading, writing, taking hikes, scanning the lake, or even the sunsets. I was under the mistaken impression that you had to commit to the entire summer in order to do that, and so I didn't decline. We had children, we always vacationed in Michigan in July, and it just wouldn't work. By the time I found out that you didn't need to commit to the entire summer, then I had other worries. Maybe there would be an upper age limit. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe I'd need a note from someone saying that I could measure up to the job. No, I didn't. Well, it all worked out, and it was the most wonderful experience that I will treasure the rest of my life. I volunteered two summers, both on Resbury Island, being the first to volunteer in the, 1970, in the 2017 season, and last September, for 10 days, again on Resbury, and I was the last volunteer. While we tend to think that the whole nation was involved with the Civil War in the 1860s, um, life was going on as usual in many parts of the country. With the opening of the Sioux Box in 1855, there was a need for lighthouses because of the increased traffic on the Great Lakes and the worries about safety. Raspberry Island Light was built in 1862 and operational the following year. But you can read about the history, you can look it up. Today's about personal experiences of the keepers. The first task in my adventure was to pack whatever I thought I might need or desire for three weeks, including food. Well, it seems that I did not pack right. <laughs> A park service tender transported me from Rice Point over to Raspberry Island. The crew was wonderful. They were even my Sherpas, hauling my gear up the 76 steps to the top of the bluff. You can see the tramway. It was built in 1903 to transport materials up for the construction of the fog signal building and the reconstruction and enlargement of the lighthouse. It's still used today as needed. My first impression was utter amazement at how beautiful it was. The vast expanse of green lawns and the impeccably painted white buildings with red roofs. The noble structure of the lighthouse. I had been issued regulation attire. Three shirts, a fleece jacket, and a windbreaker. Now for some reason, Certain sizes were in short supply, <laughs> even though I was the first volunteer of that first season, and all my shirts were men's extra large. <laughs> now, may I say that it had been decades since I had tucked a shirt into my waistband <laughs> or worn about, and I, I was not happy. <laughs> but I did, I adjusted to this, and then I also adjusted to the park service radio attached to my belt. Even though I was rather startled when the first person spoke on it and <laughs> coming out of my back pocket. <laughs> this was my first experience at being inside the National Park Service, and I was immediately struck by what my impression of the armed services has been. There were many regulations. There was law enforcement, otherwise known as protective services, and there were uniforms. There was, however, no saluting. Only oh, Ranger Fred might have liked that. <laughs> <laughs> I was privileged to be a part of an excellent team. Ranger Fred on the left and Ranger Eddie on the right. They were both kind and supportive and wonderful mentors who loved the history of the island and were a great help. They were just there half a week. And they would trade places with the cruise boat arrival on Tuesdays and Saturdays. Truly, the most fun challenge of packing was deciding what food I would have for three weeks. Now, I had always walked right by those little tiny cans of chicken and the cute little paper wrapped cans of velvet under ham, ham, ham. 
Now I bought them. <laughs> we each had a couple shelves in the pantry and also a couple shelves in the oversized refrigerator. We each prepared our own food individually on our own time, depending on our work schedule and our hunger. Although, Eddie did really love to share his favorite breakfast of homemade pancakes enhanced by pecans, craisins, and maple syrup. I settled into my room, and truly it was a room with a view. The honor and the delight of sleeping in a lighthouse never ever dimmed. Lest you think that this was a hardship post, it was not. Propane gave us fuel for the cook stove, heat for the house, and hot water. Yes, hot showers. <laughs> Solar power furnished lights for the house and the refrigerator, uh, electricity for the refrigerator, and the recharging of batteries. Ray and Fred let me choose my work responsibilities. Being so determined to major up, I said that I could clean the outhouses because I figured I could do that. In addition, I did some gardening. Early in the season, that meant digging grass out of the flower beds and weeding the vegetable gardens. There are other volunteers who come out in late May and early June to plant the gardens. The flower beds were newly established in the mid-1980s, recreating the original beds using photos and identification help from the um, State Historical Society in Madison. The flowers, the vegetables, are only grown if they were grown by the keepers, actually, back in the 1920s, 100 years ago, only those vegetables. In September, we harvested the vegetables. Potatoes, beets, tomatoes, squash, pumpkins, onions, cucumbers, and beans, the produce going to a local food shelf. Eddie and I were quite proud of our eyes beat. <laughs> <laughs> Raspberry has been called the showcase of the apostles. The cruise boats come four days a week, and during the two hours that they are on the island, the tourists can take the tour or they can just relax, picnic, hike the trails, play croquet. In addition, private boats tie up with the dock. Sailors and kayakers moor off the sand spit and then they hike the quarter mile, three quarter mile trail to the lighthouse. We might have no visitors on a cold, foggy, rainy day, or we might have up to 120 on another day. It could be that the keepers would give seven, even eight tours on a given day. One of my assignments was to greet the cruise boaters at the top of the stairs. The ranger would have greeted them down the top. My job was to lead them over to the pay station. One of my least favorite moments came one day when Ranger Fred, who was about to do a Korean history tour, had walked the people over to the house and he was going to pop in, don his lightkeeper's jacket and his hat, and come out as Tom Hessing, who was an assistant keeper in 1924. And without warning, he said, well, while I go and hunt for this assistant keeper, Marty here will give you a song and dance. <laughs> <laughs> All eyes swiveled toward me. I stumbled about. I asked if any of them had seen the big pop shit opera show Riding the Wind. And then to my horror, I burst into four lines of a song. <laughs> now you know this, and you are to sing with me now. <clears throat> I'm the keeper of the light on Ridesbury Island, again in the night for the steamboat train. With an eye on the wick and a whistle to the ships that are coming from the bay, and for me, <laughs> I was bad. <laughs> At the end of the Keeper's Tour, it was my job to take 
the tours of seven or eight at a time to the tower, and that was really fun. First of all, a beautiful indoor wooden, highly polished staircase, spiral staircase, and then up a ladder, and then through this very small door. And it was going in and out of this door several times a day for three weeks that kept me in shape. <laughs> that was a, a nice experience, and again, the people were so happy to be there. Other duties included the museum, which is located in the original keeper's side of the lighthouse. Um, at the beginning of the season, I dusted, cleaned the rooms, dusted the artifacts, and then at the end of the season, we packed them away for the winter. At the table, what you see is not an artifact, but the living, breathing Ranger Fred, <laughs> who is signing something probably very important for the benefit of photographers from the Friends of the Apostle Islands organization. Probably my favorite duty was raising the flag in the morning and lowering the flag at night, which are me back to my old Girl Scout days. Morning duties involved measuring wind, velocity, and direction, checking the chlorine level in the drinking water in the house, participating in that morning roundup when all the volunteers would call in from the different islands, um, posting the weather out on the bulletin board for the day so the people would know what was coming. Following that, I'd usually dust down the stairs, sweep the stairs from the tower, clean the floor a little bit where the tour groups had tracked in. Cruise boats that did not stop, but were scheduled regularly, would hover offshore, and the captain would talk about the island. Well, during this time, we were to appear in uniform on the back porch and wave, and wave. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let people know there was a presence on the island. And then Ranger Fred would say, okay, we have to go back in. They don't always want people in all of their vacation photos. <laughs> <laughs> Another daily task was to hike down the Sand Spit Trail and count the sailboats that were moored there. Records were very carefully kept about how many sailboats moored overnight, how many tours were taken, how many informal interactions with visitors. Late in the season, I also washed storm windows as the maintenance crews came out to put them up. As you can see, my vision of a solitary life on the island did not meet reality. We were busy. But there was time for reading in the evening or on a cold, rainy day. And I must say that the evenings were heavenly quiet, peaceful, and watching the sunset over York Island. To experience the beauty and the joy of sleeping in the lighthouse was absolutely wonderful. My favorite item in the museum was the traveling library, a sturdy wooden box of books that was delivered each month to the keeper and their families to give them a new reading supply. When I finished the reading material, that I had bought. I enjoyed reading this old edition of Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. There was time to walk the trails, to see the Queen Anne's lace, wild roses, orange hawkweed, raspberries, thimbleberries, and other vegetation, as well as crows, eagles, gulls, quivers, pine and woodpeckers, and my first sight of the old roasted sapsucker. Beautiful fungi on the North Trail reminded me of Francis Yacker, a German immigrant who served at Keeper on Raspberry for seven years in the late 1800s. He had married an Ojibwe woman and was fluent in the Ojibwe language. He etched scenes of shelf fungi, and these were exhibited in the U.S. and sold in Europe for more than $100. <clears throat> what were the best parts of being on the island? Sleeping in a lighthouse, raising the flag, morning roundup as each volunteer checked in from the other islands, sunsets, 
view up on the tower on a beautiful day, or in the middle of the night with a raging thunderstorm. All of these were wonderful, but also high on the list were the interactions with the visitors who came by cruise boat, motorboat, kayak, sailboat, because they were happy people to be around. They were happy because they were on vacation, and they were happy to be in such a beautiful place. Two experiences in particular have stayed with me. There's no campground on Raspberry Island. However, if kayakers are stranded because of poor weather, they are allowed to camp. And this happened with a group of Boy Scouts. They were so young. They were so <laughs> amazingly respectful. They were so engaging. One young lad kept asking his buddies if they had brought their uniforms, and they had. But he said, if we had our uniforms, we could give you a proper flag lowering ceremony. <laughs> they pitched their tents in the meadow, and Ranger Fred opened one of the outbuildings so that they could get in out of the weather. In the morning, there was a knock on our quarter's door, and there stood in the midst two young lads, braces on their teeth, holding out a plate of hot, deep-fried blueberry fritters. <laughs> they, were, they were a credit to young people. They were a credit to the scouting program. Late one afternoon, there appeared a couple with two gorgeous dogs, golden retrievers, but pure white, British cream, I was told. They headed down the sand spit trail, and they stayed down there for a couple hours. When they appeared again, they told me that they make this pilgrimage every September. Because they had each lost a sibling in a tragic car accident in past Septembers. And they also said that Raspberry Beach was the favorite place in all the world of another beloved global retriever that they'd lost to poisoning just a year ago. I asked how they knew it was the dog's favorite place in all the world, and they said whenever their boat approached, this dog would be uncommonly, unusually excited, wild with excitement and recognition. We here live so close to these islands that we tend to take them for granted. But it's good for us to realize how very, very special they are to many people who come from afar. Oh, you won't know why, and you can't say how such change upon you came, but once you've slept on an island, you'll never be the same. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
Having come from St. Paul and Minneapolis back in those days, we've now relocated up here, we like it so much. We get to let the rest of the world go by like it's 1929. So this is a before and after. We're going to raise you some pictures of before and after here. And this is after the renovation. When I got there in 2009, it didn't look this beautiful. Next slide. And what we do out there as we give these uh, tours, uh, which are on it as being one of the fun things we get to do, we interpret. On the inner chamber of the tall light on Michigan Island, and there's two, the oldest and the newest lighthouses out there, but go out and take the tour to learn more. There are these five dots, which appear to have been tapped in to the inner pieces of metal. Everyone thinks that that's for realignment on reconstruction. There's a whole story about how this thing was shipped from Pennsylvania to be put on Michigan Island. But the fact of the matter is, the person that did that is dead and gone. So we interpret. And when we get new information, we update. So that's kind of what we do in life, is try to make sense out of all the information that comes at us, and then we try to update with it. Before and after. This was the uh, caretaker's quarters assembled in 1929 with the expansion of the Michigan Station. Old on the far side, newer one here. And the old, there's no gardens, and the new, it really brought this thing back to its, its glory days. And that's where we get to stay. It, just really wonderful glamping. Yes, it is. <laughs> Next slide. This is a view from the top of the tall tower looking down on a lighthouse. To be up that high was kind of a fun experience. And this again, before it was renovated, and got, next slide, after the gardens had been put in place, and then later on, of course, we took care of those gardens, mostly Kathy, as I made do around the, uh, the lawnmower's nightmare, the obstacle course and all those flower beds. <laughs> that first summer that I was there, right after those gardens had been put in, they hadn't yet been planted. So to take care of them, I weeded them. I weeded dirt. We did dirt. <laughs> if it was dry, we'd get water off the gutter system that had been caught in rain barrels. So really living a simple life out there. Next slide. The tall tower. Tallest of the lighthouses. Coast Guard still takes care of it. And while we live with nature, nature lives with us. That's an osprey nest. And I'll, I'll have a picture from up above. It's been removed since then because the ospreys weren't living there. But the parks are extremely respectful of these kinds of things. When the ospreys were there, I talked to the guy that installed the solar. He said, I didn't work when the osprey was up there. We worked around it. So, next slide. That is the solar panel that, that charges the light in the top of the tower. And you see the springs there. Um, those aren't part of the, the solar. That's to keep birds off. Now my birds pooping on a solar panel. <laughs> right, and this was one of the reasons I wanted to sign up with the parks. Anyone from the Twin Cities? Jason Davis had a show on the road, and he interviewed someone that was living on the lighthouse, and someone else mentioned bucket list. I put it on my bucket list. To live with solar panels, to live off the grid, to live with a, a headlamp that you turn on and off automatically. There's all kinds of things you pick up on. And so um, that was the fun part of my experience, was getting off the grid and living like it's 1929. Yeah, next slide. <laughs> by the light. This is where... The, the Fresnel lens used to be, but of course it's been replaced since then by this really high tech collection of LED, collection of LED lights. And it, it comes on automatically at, at dark. Uh, the main lens, of course, is in the headquarters uh, just up the hill here. Next slide. I noticed in one of the other slides this ornate lattice work on the steps of the earlier lighthouses, and then more of a geometric pattern later on. And while this is kind of technical stuff, as light keepers out there, as volunteers, we kind of come to like and care about these places and the people that support them. Next slide. Stairs everywhere. Oh, more stairs. Yeah, every day we walk down those and then back up at least once, probably many more times. Many times. To go down 123. The... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people coming up would always have a different number. Um, and there were some people who came up and their challenge had been to run up. The stairs. Here we have a school so that the cable that runs the tram car on these two tracks, the cable goes over that school and it doesn't erode those steps, nor the cable. So little details. When we, when we first, I think the first time we came out together, we had bags full of all our food for three weeks and all our stuff, and the tram wasn't running at the time. So, just as someone else had seen some scouts out there in kayaks, I saw some scouts at the bottom of the stairs. I said, are scouts still trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind of obedient, triple, thrifty, very clean, and reverent? They said, oh, you're one of us. And they carried our gear <laughs> back. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, and, and as, uh, as Marty mentioned, taking care of the outhouse. We have one outhouse, and it's really nice and modern. And, and we share it. our house with everybody that comes out there. Yes. So living on the island is not for everyone. This is some simple living out on Michigan. And part of taking care of it, we decided was making sure there were nice flowers in there. And my <laughs> table for the jar of flowers, I brought in that log, and at the time I didn't know it, I was also bringing in an enormous black spider about the size of my fist, <laughs> that I later found it was up about making its home on an extra roll of toilet paper. Oh, no. When you live on the island, it's simple. We don't have solar for hot water. You take a, a solar shower bay. In some seasons, it's warm enough that we'll bathe in the lake. No soap. There's beautiful, clean Lake Superior water. Now the time it gets kind of chilly. And then for, for Karna and those that are afraid of bear, we do recommend bear spray. <laughs> I've had bear sightings on the island in my earlier years and, and signs of the bears later on. And you'll learn to make noise and live with them, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you saw them. Yeah, yeah. Some, some different wildlife sightings. And this is what they leave behind, the footprints of the mergansers. And when we would go down in the morning to take the, the weather measurements, we would usually see a little group of organzer ladies, and they were kind of shy. They would take off when they saw us come. And then in the evening, my favorite Total thing to do, Total Total Patrol. Patrol. we'd put on our, our headlights and go out and walk the sidewalk of the yard. And we'd find, we'd count them, see how many, how many toads are there tonight. They would have their usual places that, that they would be. And the largest, again, about, about the size of my fist, um, was this fellow, and we named him in honor of the inventor of the lighthouse lens, the Fernand lens. <laughs> His name was Gus. After Augustine Fernand. Yeah. <laughs> being out there and living with nature, being out there in the night during toll patrol, and having it at quiet, having the stars come out, and hearing nothing but the waves is, again, living like it's 1929. This is a view from the crow's nest of the lighthouse, and I, I leaned over the edge and took a picture of that osprey nest. Again, since we moved, but uh, a sign of living with nature and nature living with us. Lots of artifacts, as we mentioned before. This is one that we came across on the beach that had been tossed up by a leg, didn't know what it was, and we weren't quite sure what to do with it. Our supervisor said, put it back where you found it. And we did. The leg took it back the next day. Gone with the sands of time. So if you do find garbage out there, please bring that off with you. But if you find something rusty that looks like it's really old, put it back to the sands of time. Don't put this one back to the sands of time. Uh, Bob, this was a, a boat I was saying maybe near some of the buildings you uh, talked about. This was hauled up one winter and not used after that. You can see the rusty cable coiled there, and you can see the footings of a building nearby and some other 50-gallon barrels of drums. If you find things like that, take some pictures, but leave everything else behind. Just a sign of when you live out there, it's almost like being a treasure hunter. And if you come out for a tour, the same kind of thing. There's kind of an excitement. There are other things on the other islands. There are things on this island that we won't tell you about because you're supposed to go out and find them on your own. So uh, very neat stories that, that we experienced when we were out there feeling like treasure hunters. One year to the east of the main dock, I found this timber, obviously not just a log. This glove showing a little bit of the scale. I didn't find it the next couple of years. It had been removed and moved someplace else by the lake. One of our favorite things also is meeting the people who come out to the islands and um, talking with them about their interest in, in the place that they've been there before, where they've come from. We had a lot of folks who lived in the area who'd never been out before, or people who had been there to Michigan Island years before the renovation and were astounded to see what had been done to the place and, and really delighted by it. And as, as Marty said, meeting the people that are on vacation from the big cities and really need a stress break, they, they are like happy campers. And there's a Native American saying that says, when we live away from nature, our hearts harden. So when we get back to nature and we find each other out in this beautiful setting, Everyone's in a really good mood. See some fun comments. You see 123 steps. Oof. <laughs> they had a little trouble getting out there. Um, I've done a little bit of self-study, and this is on Michigan Island. And back in the day, the natives and the voyagers would sometimes bend a, a tree to, its, to their will to point out, hey, this would be the best direction to a particular harbor. Next scene shows nature doing a bit of its own bending to its will. This is the erosion cliffs right by the main dock on Michigan. They're different every year I go back. One year, something falling away, and that tree decided to grow up anyway. 
And that starts to change with some of the recent storms. As was mentioned earlier, our, our jobs include going out to the trail, going out on the trail and checking out the campsite. There's one campsite on Michigan and not always occupied because it's not easy to get to necessarily. But we get to walk the mile out to the campsite, check it out, make sure it's all in good order, <coughs> make sure that the trail is passable. If there are small branches or trees down that we can easily move, we take care of that. Otherwise, because it's in the Baylor Nelson Wilderness area, if there's a big tree down, if we can't get through that ourselves, we have to let people know about it. From the Park Service, and they don't come in with chainsaws. They preserve that soundscape, and they will take it out manually. Imagine part of your job description being, you must walk about a mile to a campsite through a beautifully preserved natural soundscape. <laughs> Wonderful aspect of the, of the position. And there's one of the gardens after it's been planted. Um, as it's covering it up. If, if the garden weren't there, you'd be able to see where a bear had sharpened its claws on one of the timbers that holds up that sign. So the bears do get into the grounds. We try to keep them away with the horns and make them noise and that kind of thing. These white rocks are uh, replaced in historically accurate positions from the photos back in the day. And these tall flowers are planted as Kathy, we're going to highlight who plants these. By the uh, volunteers with the Friends of the Apostles. These flowers stand up extremely high. They're as tall as they look there, but we've had some big storms the previous night. And sometimes they weather them and sometimes they don't. But a lot of work bringing this back to a very historically accurate representation of 1929 and since. We quickly get to near the end of our, our slide presentation here, and I think uh, I can say for all of the volunteers and anyone that's been on the island, we have endless stories. So if you stay after it and maybe have some Q&A, you'll learn some more. This is a, a beautiful picture, and we saw a slide, I think, with John's uh, set. The lake is the boss. The lake is the boss. This is down near the campsite, about a mile to the main uh, dock on Michigan Island. And while over the years I've heard of search and rescues going on, and we all are trained as volunteers. We're trained in first aid, CPR, how to use the radio, how to respond. Well, this last year, Kathy and I were involved with the search and rescue that took place in uh, the late uh, summer. We were about ready to go to bed. 10 o'clock, we get a call. Can you get out there to the campsite? We go, yeah, we can. Buddy system, because it's dark, and it's a, it's a bad, slippery trail. We get out there, and we met up with another park representative out here. She's combing the beach the other direction. She said, can you go this way? In the dark, at night, we go this way, holding hands, making sure we're safe. They're down trees along there. We're looking for survivors. We're looking for boats. We're looking for anything that we can use to help with this search and rescue. We got back to the, uh, the house. The other portion of the beach was safer. I went alone. You went up. And we continued the search. Very surreal experience. This beautiful setting. It was a full moon that night. Waves lapping on the shore. And then around the bend of the island came the thunder of the search helicopter. And it's searchlight blazing through the dark of the night. Everyone involved with that search did their job wonderfully. The communities came together from various states. I'm not sure where the helicopter came from, but Redcliffe was involved, Washburn was involved, many people involved. No one liked the outcome. One life was saved, the others were lost. Everyone did their job. And uh, we've come to know and care for the people that were out there in the middle of the night, one, two o'clock in the morning, doing what they'd been trained to do. One person said, I'm too tired, I have to come off the water. That's good training. And so the search went on until 10 o'clock the next morning when it was completed. It was, a, yeah, it, was a, it was a sad, very sobering experience, and I have nothing but great respect for all the I get a little choked up here because I see some faces I've come to know over the years and they were out there, all these people, not knowing that they were going to be called into that. And they're ready to do it every day. So, kind of an interesting thing. Remember, as we have fun, as we, as we let our hearts unharden from the big city in which we get in touch with nature, remember, the lake, nature, they're the boss. So, next slide, please. When I was there alone in 2009, I had my horn and I had a golf ball. And a plastic golf ball so that I wouldn't break any historic glass. And um, in the evenings, I would sit and play songs. 
like east of the sun and west of the moon, as I was literally east of the sun setting and west of the moon rising on that particular dock. So Kathy and I are going to finish with a song written in 1929, the year that Michigan Island was expanded and that the house that we lived in was uh, built. And we'll just have a couple of closing slides. I'm so glad that as I've watched those stars in Northern Lights, you've seen the Northern Lights with us out there, I'm so glad that I found Kathy, a partner that would go out to the park so I could come back after my, my solo stay. And again, as you have questions for any of the volunteers here or any of the other park representatives here, please stick around and ask some questions. And for now, Marty, can you take the switch from Kathy? And uh, a little song, we'll go over here, Kathy. Mm -hmm. From 1929, we've shortened it because we know your truth boat is moving soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would, we would play music most evenings, play word games most evenings. I did a lot of knitting, a lot of reading, a lot of extra time. Let's see, we have another. Okay, those are pretty close. From 1929, a song called Old Monterey, another place by another scene. Right. 